As someone who has worked in the fashion industry for a long time, and then also in other industry, I have to say that the level of knowledge, awareness and engagement on sustainable practices in this industry is unmatched. Additionally, this industry has a unique ability to influence society and inspire other industry. So I'm really thrilled to open this third season with two people who have been working on sustainable fashion for a long time and have inspired a lot of young professionals. One of their latest projects is a book about sustainable fashion in which I'm also a contributor for the storytelling part. Happy to hear more from Senate and Sally about how the book came to be and also about the framework that they have created. Enjoy! Sustainability at Work is a podcast about sustainability in the workplace and in companies. My name is Samara and I've been working with sustainability for almost 10 years. Hello everybody! Welcome to Sustainability at Work. Uh, so this is the first episode of the third season. So very happy to start uh, with you and with the great book, which is about sustainable fashion. Uh, welcome uh, to my two guests. Thank you for being here. You're right, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So this is the book. Very happy to uh, go through it uh, with some question and uh, amazing topics. So I'm going to start immediately with uh, one first question. So how did the idea of the book came uh, to be? So um, the idea came out uh, uh, thanks to Stanley, actually, because uh, we were busy with uh, the um, time of COVID, uh, with uh, the switch uh, into uh, Zoom and teaching through Zoom. So then uh, we put together like a very intense schedule of extra activities for our students, webinars, uh, and uh, meeting with uh, with the industry profiles. So the idea was really to create uh, some extra law that could help the students in the preparation for the assessment in the meantime that we were in lockdown. And one day, uh, Sally, she said, oh my God, we're having such an amazing archive of digital recordings of all of this Zoom, because uh, just to give an idea, we were meeting people from Encourage, Kinsey, VCG, and we were really talking about this uh, big pandemic that was changing so much the the whole uh, industry in the world. So then one day Sally said that uh, we should maximize all all of this digital archive. And uh, and he actually said, oh, maybe we we could write a book. Uh, And then I said, what a book, I don't have time. And actually it's so true because in my role, I'm running the course and it was this uh, transitional moment with uh, with the COVID scenario. So I would just, you know, focus in running, running, running and trying to keep the course uh, functioning and working. But uh, having this uh, question uh, really helped me to think, oh, maybe there is an opportunity for this. So I remember that after a couple of days, and Sally Kissing Conquer, I sent a view and I said, oh, maybe it could be uh, a good idea. Um, and then uh, uh, she knew some people that they recently published the book with, with Ravitage. So then we started with, with the official steps. So it, I don't know if you ever wrote a book, but it starts with the book proposals. Um, and then uh, from the initial conversation that we just <laughs> a random conversation on Zoom at the end of one of these webinars that we had for our students, uh, uh, we managed to start this uh, project. It's a baby of, of the COVID. I guess, I guess so. And yeah, just to add what Sonia's saying, so we had these amazing experts that we were able to lean on and we were so touched that when we actually went to them and said, listen, listen this, this is our idea, they actually also said to us that this is really important and this needs to be done. So they were jumping at the bit to actually write for us. So that was really particularly exciting. And I think that's when we also realised that this was something that's going to be really important for for us to do, but also for um, for future people, as students, people, um, to read the book. So yes, it was something that was a um, definitely, I think, a bit of a genius idea and pulling it together was certainly helped by a lot of um, great um, contributors. So because you teach at uh, uh, Instituto Marangoni in London, I guess your primary audience for this book was students and also because of how it came to be, I guess the primary audience was uh, students, is it? Or, or you were thinking also about other uh, audiences? Yeah, I certainly think in in the beginning we were absolutely thinking and focused very much on the student. 
And um, one of the reasons why we looked specifically at the framework, which I know we'll discuss in much more detail later, was because our real concern that when we were trying to talk about responsible business, there really wasn't a suitable framework that could be used in order to look at the whole business. So um, we knew that we wanted to develop something that was easy to understand, that was clear, concise, contemporary, and that we could use in the classroom. So certainly our first thoughts were, yeah, absolutely, our students, not just Marangoni, but students everywhere. Um, but actually, as we've gone on, we've realised that it's touched and interested a lot more people in that. I don't know if you want to expand tonight. Yeah, yeah. in particular, also, we noticed how uh, the book can also attract uh, professionals uh, from the last uh, um, book launch that we had in Paris. It was very interesting, probably later, we're going to discuss more in details, but it was very interesting to see a more mature audience attending the book launch in uh, Paris in particular. Two venture capital uh, came in. So the first one is Pin Venture that are investing into sustainable fashion, but then also uh, Plug and Play that is another big VC. Um, so it's interesting to see how there is definitely focus and an interest for the students, but then also uh, from big adult adults uh, uh, audience like uh, like me see. And I think what you touch, Sally, uh, also with this idea that we are going to talk about but adopt the framework is really a super interesting point of this book um, and I think it comes from your expertise teaching students this idea of connecting the dots much more than maybe professionals who are focused on on their own niche and so why why a framework and and why not maybe focusing on more specific topic uh, which I love the framework but but why it was uh, we decided for that yeah, no, 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 really good question. So um, in the classroom, we're trying to teach the students about responsible business and right the way from the product to the shop floor and trying to talk to them about understanding the importance of sustainable best practice throughout the whole business strategy. And I'm struggling with that. We were using older frameworks. So a really good example would be the seven things. But though that is a framework that's many years old. And while, of course, still very useful, we didn't feel it was up to date enough in order to consider responsible business practice. So we worked hard at one point it was six, at one point it was seven, at one point it was 10, and at one point it was a paradigm, another point it was something else. And then we eventually settled um, on the fact that it should be a framework. And the fact that we felt it should be a framework because it was something that's going to constantly evolve. So we're really um, aware of the fact that we've written in very much the, um, what we see happening in the industry now, but we also understand the industry is moving fast and hopefully in the right direction when we think about responsible practice. So as other innovations and um, elements are coming through, that will be able to be added into the framework. So this framework is something that can constantly evolve. Hopefully the framework will stay for many years, but you can populate the framework with many other innovations. Yeah. And in particular, reflecting on this innovation, um, I think uh, the framework can also look at some of the new trends that came out uh, following COVID. So, for example, the emphasis on customer experience, more and more brands uh, in the marketing effort are moving from uh, uh, push strategy to a push strategy. And they really try to share more about values, about the importance of experience, the importance of having uh, uh, moments of with the clients, with the customers, so then they can remember not only the program, but also the experience that they had uh, with that product. Uh, then also the framework can look at some new trends like the digitalization of the post-COVID scenario, uh, the importance of responsible marketing. Uh, so definitely it's, uh, it's the framework can really provide brands, businesses, and retailers a new, um, a new perspective it's a sort of new pair of glasses in which they can look um, in a more strategic way to the context that they are uh, living and they're working. We feel really you know, excited by this. Well, we've just finished teaching a, a busy term and we've taught in and around the framework. And it's something that really resonates very well with the students, really easy to understand. And that was one of the things we wanted to do. We didn't want to develop something that was really complicated. And that made people go, I don't understand this. I have to move away. It's too scary, like many frameworks and um, what academic models are. So we feel really proud that what we've developed is something that is really easy to understand, really easy to digest, and very easy um, and, um, and useful to populate. So this is good for fashion business students, but also potentially fashion design students when they're actually developing their own um, collections and future businesses. Yeah, and even startups 
because um, uh, Samara, for example, in July, we're going to be delivering a breakfast workshop at the Mills Fabrica. It's a business accelerator based here in London, started in Hong Kong. And uh, this breakfast uh, workshop will be made for the members that are, all of them are innovative startups that they are focused on innovation, uh, green supply chain, innovative textile. Uh, so again, that is a very good example that can um, provide evidence that the framework can work for students, but then also for uh, startups, entrepreneurs. Uh, so there are definitely um, wider opportunities for the use of this uh, framework. And I think the fact of the framework is also a little bit uh, like an answer to many people who are saying, are questioning if the, the, the fashion industry can really be a sustainable industry because the fashion industry is so connected to trends, uh, to changes, to consumption. And so I think this idea of, uh, you say the glasses, something like a, a, something to look at the world maybe in a different way from the past and to a bit change that perspective. Um, so can the, the fashion industry really be sustainable or is this just a trend like some people say? Yeah, we know we really don't think so. And we don't like talking about sustainability as a trend and we haven't done so for, for many years actually in the classroom. We really think this is an important macro movement here to stay and will continue to get more and more important. And certainly from our perspective as teachers, we see that the student has a real, real interest and of course a genuine concern about the environment and also operating in a more sustain, sustainable and respectful um, way. So no, we really don't want to call it a trend and would never call it a trend and think it's going to continue to go and gain importance. It's also um, to be very important in the future just because uh, it's going to be the new mindset. Um, it should really be the really competitive advantage that businesses uh, should be looked at. And another point that uh, I really hope that it can change at the moment, a lot of brands and retailers, they are involved with uh, responsible business or sustainability. Uh, with small teams, so uh, they think that just because there is the, the sustainable team, yeah, they can tick the box, but actually it should not be just a team of five, six, seven people. If it can really be seen as the competitive advantage, the sustainable competitive advantage, where sustainable means that it can last uh, for for years uh, as, the, as the strong USP point of differentiation, then obviously it will not need the just one team because it's going to be the priority of anyone that is working for, for that brand. You know, another thing that we see in the classroom, which we find actually very refreshing, is when you actually talk about sustainability, the students sort of almost rolls their eyes and it really questions the term. And so I think that is something that's really, really, really great. And they know and they really do debate and discuss brands and their genuine sustainable cred credentials and whether they're greenwashing and green sheening. And um, we had a great debate in classroom last week when we were wondering whether the future of the industry is all about brands born sustainable rather than brands that are trying to adopt to sustainable practices. So they're really, these, these guys who will be the future leaders of really sort of opening up and really starting to think and, and question our practices and also understanding that sustainability is a very important movement. It's interesting, actually, when you look at the book, we, we develop a framework to um, uh, measure good practice essentially but actually as, as we've also understood from the framework now is what we can also do is we can also or students and others can use it to measure poor practice hopefully that won't happen too much but actually you can use it on on many levels it's not just about showcase of the brand sustainable potential that actually could go the other way as well which I think also gets very interesting when you think about it as an academic framework mm -hmm. So what, what are the major changes that you've seen in this industry since you started, especially connected to sustainability, really, uh, since you started thinking and, and analyzing this topic? Well, definitely uh, the major change was uh, um, with regards to the consumers uh, and in particular their behavior uh, towards sustainable and ethical fashion. Uh, um, during the lockdown, uh, in most of the countries, shops were closed. So for the first time, uh, um, consumers, they started reflecting on uh, how production uh, can be placed on the other side of the world. So 
but then it was clear uh, that uh, more and more consumers, they wanted to have more sustainable fashion. Consumers were questioning where my clothes um, um, are made. And so it was interesting to see this uh, uh, progression in terms of the consumers. Uh, but then also um, other big changes when you're looking at uh, uh, streetwear, athleisure wear, uh, that also was the result of the post-COVID scenario. Um, the whole world was in lockdown. We were working using Zoom, so most of the time the um, the growing uh, um, importance of sportwear and athleisure wear was linked to the fact that we were at home, and that was also linked to the uh, rebirth of the sneaker culture. Um, and it was interesting to see also more and more luxury brands that they started, uh, you know, including uh, sneakers in their range plan. Uh, and then other key uh, changes are related to the digitalization and technology when it comes to consumer demands. Uh, there was a digital acceleration as most of the reports were calling. Uh, more and more um, consumers that were buying and purchasing everything online, obviously, because the stores were, were closed. And, um, and it was interesting to see how also from the brands and retailer perspective, they started thinking um, in an omni-channel perspective. Well, for the first time, uh, uh, there was a real commitment for creating this blended experience between offline and online. Uh, for a long time, uh, omni-channel has been like a certain buzzword, but definitely in the post-COVID scenario, uh, it became, uh, and in COVID, it became uh, the, in the priority because obviously they were really focus on creating this blended uh, experience. So definitely a very new uh, mix, a uh, wide mix of uh, changes and uh, new scenarios. Mm -hmm. So uh, you touched already a, a little bit about this, but when you launched this book uh, first uh, in Italy, in Milan, uh, then in London, I think, and now in Paris. Uh, did you see any changes on the way people, the audience that came to the event or organizers of the event approach sustainable fashion in these different countries or pretty much everything is the same? Well, definitely there are free fashion capitals, but the approach to sustainability and the knowledge about sustainability, responsible business um, is different. Uh, so uh, in the land, so when Milan was the first uh, um, city where we had the book launch. It was uh, in the amazing location of the Fondazione Franca Sozzani in Milan, so very central. Um, and uh, there, the, the audience was a mix between uh, uh, industry and the enthusiasts on sustainability and responsible fashion. Uh, Milan is, is a key city focused on sustainable development. We also had uh, the initial introduction uh, uh, to the night with, with a video um, from the Councillor of the Economic Development. So Alistair Capello, she was actually mentioning how Milan is pioneer in sustainable development when it comes to renewable energies, energy efficient, efficiency measures. Uh, uh, but definitely the audience that we found in Milan is different from what we found then in London. In London, the idea was to have uh, um, all the contributors uh, but then also businesses and uh, researchers. So we had a lot of academics also attending the uh, London event. Um, and regarding Paris, uh, my um, first uh, um, comment also when I shared with, with Sally was that in Paris, the audience was uh, very mature, industry focused though. We had the two BC. Then now uh, by accident, our event, was uh, the day after the end of VivaTech, that is this uh, major uh, technology-focused event. Uh, also, Elon Musk was one of the guests. The president of France, so a lot of people, and our event was just one day after that. <laughs> so uh, I think in town, there were still a lot of entrepreneurs and um, uh, sustainable enthusiasts, uh, quite, quite young, know, digital-focused. So then, um, for example, there was a plug and play, the VC that came in, uh, they came also with the two of their startups that they are investing, uh, and then Spin Venture also, they brought in uh, uh, two of the startups that they attended VivaTech, they're focusing digital. 
So definitely uh, Paris, um, I really felt that the audience was mature, even the kind of question that they were asking at the end, uh, because in Paris we had uh, a, a mini panel uh, and then at the end there were some questions. So definitely it was a more mature um, audience uh, in line with uh, the big commitment and investment that uh, uh, President Macron is doing now for technology, for innovation, for startups. So probably it's a city that is very really focused on this uh, uh, responsible business uh, uh, across different sectors, so not just in fashion, uh, but definitely the kind of conversation that I had with the guests were mature conversation on digital technology, the intersection of eating technology. So definitely it was uh, a very positive and engaged audience in Paris, in line with what the country and the nation is doing. What about the students at um, at Instituto Marangoni, and where are they coming from mostly? Um, we have a very international demographic. So, first of all, we have to say that in fashion business, it, it, it's quite important to speak the language and be confident in the language. So, we have. Uh, a mix set. Uh, so we have uh, Northern Europe, Central Europe, Continental Europe, then we have some students from uh, the Asian countries, Russia, South America, uh, but we have quite a mix uh, uh, audience. Uh, so then, uh, yeah, very international classes. I always say that it's like teaching at United Nations. <laughs> You know, those international, super international school of the United Nations all over the world. <laughs> I have a near friend who studied at the United Nations school in Vienna. So that next week, she always got a lot of stories. So it's always very similar. Yeah. Okay. So in the book, you have a lot of, uh, I love that you have a lot of case studies, a lot of different uh, contributors. Um, I'm not going to ask you to choose your favorite baby among all the, the ones that are in the book, but, uh, but is, is there one or a couple that you would like to highlight or just the high, if you want to unpack a little bit how it was to work with different contributors? Absolutely. I'll, I'll go first and tonight you can, you can chip in. But we, we had a number of contributors helping us out and writing for us, I think, sort of around about 35 in total. And we've got for each chapter... So down to each section of the framework, we've got three or four contributors. It's hard to tell you which one I like the best because they're all they're all amazing. Um, we've got a huge thank you to Karen Spurgeon, Dr. Karen Spurgeon, who really helped us with the material section and unpicking materials, but also going much deeper in that and sort of looking at uh, dye and that the issue in and around uh, the dyeing of clothes, which was super interesting. Um, and then we've got uh, Felix Kruger, which is another favourite of mine from the Boston Consulting Group, who was talking about circularity and the rise to second hand. And then um, another favourite of mine was uh, um, Lucy Litwack, who's the CEO of um, Coco de Mer, And she wrote in Perceived Value, talking about the importance of supporting communities and um, credible charities with um, and, and giving money back. Uh, what else is my favourite? Oh dear, um, you're putting me on the spot. Matthew Dixon was another great one who also wrote in and around community talking about diversity and making sure that we had a diverse table at the board table as well as on the shop floor. But you tonight? Um, well, as I said from the beginning, this book was uh, coming out from those incredible webinars that we had during the COVID time. So we managed to achieve 35 uh, contributors, but basically because most of them, they were actually regular guest speakers of this uh, TV schedule that we put together <laughs> during the COVID um, lockdown because uh, obviously we try our best uh, for providing uh, the best experience to the students. Well, some of the key contributors that are on top of the list, well, definitely uh, we worked a lot with eco uh, so probably it's a very big name uh, in the fashion industry. And um, uh, Nicola, uh, Olivia's brother, is one of our regular uh, guest speaker for, for the courses. So when uh, we thought about the conclusions, um, obviously we recognize the importance of having some strong conclusions that somehow could set uh, uh, a sort of summary of what has been said, but then also they could represent a blue sky thinking what will be next. Uh, so Nicola Giugini signed the conclusions, for example, um, and then also the introductions. Um, uh, the words in the introduction are quite important because uh, we try to have a clear justification and explanation of the framework using uh, 
a senior partner from from the McKinsey office in Milan, focused on fashion. So definitely um, some of these key names uh, are in the book. Then also for the uh, chapters about the green environment in the retail space, because uh, again, that is an area where sometimes brands and retailers, they've got that obviously the commitment should be also at the last step of the supply chain when, uh, when the collections are in the store. So, for example, for, for that chapter, we had uh, uh, Juliet Russell, uh, who has been uh, um, head of sustainability at Stella, and she was actually contributing for the new store that they open in uh, New Bond Street. So, definitely very good names. Um, then, um, Nuna Source, for example, uh, we're, we were very keen to have Nuna Source in the book. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the brand. It's this new, sustainable, responsible brand, and LVMH uh, acquired uh, um, some shares there. So then, obviously, Nona Source is not a good name. I mean, the, the list could be long. We can come and can go on. Yeah, no, it, it, it goes on. I was also thinking about Lorna uh, Bates. Cass, Cass, she was amazing as well. She wrote a brilliant, brilliant part in on communication about twenty of um, flashy practice in the green fashion. And we're really, really proud of, of everybody who came forward and, and wrote for us. And it was met with such a wonderful response, like I said earlier on. And even when we expanded out, we went to brands to ask for things like images. And we spoke to them about what we were doing and why we were doing it. And there was a, a real sort of feeling of, please do this. We need to do this. We need to sort of break it down in simple terms across the whole of the business and then get it to the students so that they can start understanding it and everybody can start digesting it and thinking this is something that is manageable and, and can be done. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's hard to pull out some names. Of course, you, you, you also had as well, you wrote a podcast in Gitpo, so not to forget you. Thank you very much for that connection because I wanted to go back a little bit to the students. Uh, so you have a lot of experience with the student. How has education changed uh, in this year uh, to update to the new changes to the, to the, to the industry? How do you keep the program fresh? Because it seems like there is a, a new thing every week in sustainable fashion, a new technology, a new something. And so how do you keep it fresh and, um, and up, can update the programs really? Regarding education and all the changes, while well, the keywords is uh, being uh, fast and quick uh, in adapting, um, with all the changes into the progress, but at the same time, we need to have the critical eyes for understanding what is going to last and what is going to be just a fake trend. Uh, so we, we manage as much, as much as possible to include, uh, key changes related to technology, to sustainable, um, topics. Uh, so more and more the students, uh, uh, they are familiar with an ability from any perspective. So it's not just, uh, knowing about, um, the supply, the changes in the supply chain management but also reflecting about the link between sustainability and inclusivity. So then, uh, I don't know, the new marketing campaign can become responsible. So we had more and more uh, examples of marketing strategies submitted from our students where they look at uh, a responsible manifesto that some uh, brands or retailers can, um, can adopt. So for example, in the unit of project management, the students uh, not only think about a new green sustainable store, but they also try to define how green, responsible and sustainable can be the marketing campaign from that store with a program on its eyes. So, so uh, we always try to have a very holistic approach in any changes and uh, adaptation of the courses. Uh, um, uh, another good way for being always updated is also having guest speakers that they come in. That's why we work so close with uh, McKinsey and BCG because obviously they can help students and also the academic team to understand that how to read these macro macro and micro changes in the consumer behavior and then uh, in the brand and the retainers. Uh, and definitely we are all aware that uh, teaching uh, something so magmatic that can change so quickly, like fashion business or business, um, it's, um, it's a bit of a challenge and it's so important to have, you know, the eyes open and try to, uh, you know, be innovative and uh, adapt adapting quickly the curricular, the programs, uh, and, uh, and also in particular, the guest speakers, the assignment briefs, the, the brands that we choose uh, for, for our units. So, so, um, 
I remember, for example, three years ago, Veja was just at the beginning of this uh, sneaker fever. Now everyone has a, a pair of Veja or Pangaya. So then uh, I remember that some of these key names, they actually came out from the assignment brief that we had in some units. And um, yeah, so this is the way that we yeah. <laughs> I think it's all about sort of debate and discussion. So the students, certainly in, in this whole post-COVID environment more than ever, coming in and looking at the industry and, and questioning the industry very refreshingly. And we debate, we discuss the change that's needed. So these are real sort of dynamic um, students that we see in the classroom and then we will be sending out into industry. So it's so a real sort of trailblazers. And you're sending out and sending them out in the industry. What happens then? Uh, what, what What is the experience that you have from them? What are the difficulties and the challenges that they encounter when they go from academia to the industry? Is that difficult? Is that challenging in a way that maybe you go from the ideal to a less ideal? What is the experience? Well, I think what we do is, and this is, I, I teach at Instituto Marangoni, I also teach at University of Westminster. And what we do at Westminster as well, at Marangoni, there's an option there as well is for um, work-based learning. So students can go out in, at Westminster as a whole year in industry. And that is an incredibly useful thing because it really gives the students a really good idea of, of the industry and perhaps actually what parts of the industry they don't want to go into, even they'd actually originally thought they had wanted to go into that. And sort of making them realistic and um, very much focused and 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 committed to, to you know to their future path. So um, I think what we we have is a student that's got a very clear understanding of the industry when they get to graduation. We have many international students, as I was saying. So some of them choose to stay and work in the UK now for a couple of years. Some of many of them go off and travel to other countries and work in other countries. But we have a really uh, really high success rating both at Marangoni and the University of Western Scott with our employability. And we're really proud of that at both schools because we really do teach our students contemporary information. And then they become very desirable to recruiters and to um, uh, fashion companies. And we certainly have many stories that we can tell when students come to us and say, I've been, I've been hate hunted by X, Y, and Z. And that's very common for us to hear that as the student gets to the point when they're sort of nearing graduation. Do they have any difficulties because of the sustainable fashion specifically or the challenges are the same that they are for all students entering an industry with professionals? I think where it is that the students really aware as well of you know other drivers to sustainable movements such as resales, such as rental, are also based in and around the economic crisis. And we teach that, of course, as well. We're not just idealistic and just saying, you know, we are practical as well. We understand that there are different drivers and different movements. So I think this, when the student goes out, they are very much aware of, of what's going on in the industry. They they found their niche, or they're finding their niche based on our teaching and their learnings independently. So they're able to really sort of cut through in, a, in, a, in an innovative way. And both for University of Westminster and Marion Gurney, you'll see quite a lot of students um, with an entrepreneurial spirit. So they're going off and they're starting their own businesses. And at Marion Gurney in particular, there's this fantastic unit, and so I can talk to you about it, but it's the Honours Project where the student develops their own business. And many students will go on and um, carry out and start that business once they graduate. It's very exciting. It's in the third year and it's called Honours Project. It's the business plan unit. And uh, we tried to develop the units in a way that uh, it, it's very realistic. So during the academic year, for example, we run this uh, um, X Factor moment and similar to X Factor, the students, they have to pitch the business idea to different uh, uh, consultants, to different uh, professionals, so from McKinsey, from Equid. Uh, and then uh, the idea is uh, just to come out with a new business, it could be either a product or a service. And then the students may have uh, the full development of the business plan. So they go through the audit with the macro and micro environment. Uh, they run on the key strategic frameworks for assessing the macro and micro environment. Then they develop a marketing strategy. Then they develop a, a, a management section and the financial part of the business plan. So technically at the end uh, of this unit, they're also ready to you know, apply for a business incubator and really try to develop the idea if there is a uh, enough innovation and, and the blue ocean is strong. Just to also um, add for both universities, there's a lot of career support 
So there's more at the University of Westminster and Marangoni focused on career development, essentially. So CV writing, cover letter writing, interview practice. I'm, I'm really thankful to all these students because in my years as a professional from the inside, I got so much support from them because when they start working for also big companies, uh, they are the ones that often are um, in, uh, encouraged to scout around for supplier, for new supplier, for new materials, for new companies to work with. And sometimes, the, the, of course, they are much more open uh, to looking into different options in the supply chain. And so sometimes you, you see amazing projects, sustainable projects, born from their dedication within a big company to to bring on some small changes and create some new projects and really looking into new new possibilities. So yeah. So what is the plan after the book? We're closing up. So uh, the book, I, I guess you you are a bit exhausted after finishing the book and promoting it, but uh, are you already looking at the next step for, for the book to be bigger or for new projects? Yeah, we feel really, really happy with the way um, everybody's responded to the book. So, yeah, thanks to everybody that's read it and just some lovely feedback. Um, ultimately, the the reason why we developed the framework is so that you could actually update the framework. So there could be a second, third, fourth, fifth edition. We've got the energy. As you will then see different experts um, adding in their insights and as innovations come, as we mentioned earlier on, those innovations can also be added to the framework. So there's that option. Um, also, what we're looking at doing is in webinars to further promote the uh, framework and to make sure that it's something that students can use or students know how to use if they want to start looking at measuring sustainable business practice or, as I said earlier on, perhaps unsustainable business practice should they dare. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of exciting things that we can we can carry on and we can do with this to watch this space. What do you think tonight? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, as you said, the idea is to come out probably with a second or third edition. Uh, promotion for the book is still on. So I'm sorry because you said the promotion is not well, it's still on and, and we really try to um, get as much as possible outside there so then the book can be known, the framework can be known. Um, then potentially in the future, it would be nice not only to have workshops for, for students for the framework, but then also for professionals. Um, as I said, I was really impressed from the audience attending the Paris event and, uh, yeah, probably there is, uh, a sort of blue ocean and a sort of potential also in exploring, uh, uh, that path of a more adult, uh, audience for the book, uh, because definitely, yeah, at the moment, new regulations are coming out. There is so much pressure for European Union also in the, in the European countries for coming out with clear regulations. I think, uh, just because um, is um, is becoming like a real priority, uh, these regulations are coming out. So probably not only regulations, but even frameworks that, that in a sort of uh, self-reflective mode can have businesses to to assess where they are um, could be like a good uh, uh, way for working in the future. So yeah, just and just on that point, actually, something that we haven't haven't spoken about really in the framework. It's it's the a section called governance. And that's something that we're particularly proud of. Um, it is a section that looks at different companies, charities, certifiers, um, and how businesses and people need to look and utilize uh, this this area in order to act responsibly. And it's, it's good to see that many brands are now looking at those certifications um, and rules and regulations coming where they will have to. But I think... Also in the classroom, what we've seen is a lot of students going, oh yeah, I, I, I'm looking for these bits now and I understand more about them. I understand more about the SDG, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's a really important thing that's that's coming through very strongly. That the juggernauts will also look at developing around that area we need to, to make sure that the public is visible because we didn't think it was particularly visible when we started writing the book. And it was actually quite hard for us to get that list that we've got. And it's by no means an extensive list. We want to make sure that that list is a very visible list so that um, industry, students, everyone can go and understand where they can go to in order to get support if they want to act uh, and trade responsibly. I think it's the best uh, place to, to stop. And um, I think this book is great uh, because the framework really creates uh, something that stays there, as you say, Sally, 
but then you can really build on it. And what you can build is really a community. So I really hope also the new project about the podcast and, and the webinar can really grow from there because with this book, you can really create a huge community that can inspire each other. Just like the, the contributors here are already inspired, but but also grow that and update. I think it, it, it's really amazing. So good luck with that. And thank you so much for being here and for sharing all uh, your um, learnings from this book. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye.